Hello, my name is Bob Hartwig and I'm President and Economist at the Insurance Information Institute. Today we'll be discussing the Deepwater Horizon disaster, the resulting release of oil into the Gulf of Mexico, and the insurance market impacts that we know about today. This presentation is part of a much larger presentation that is continuously updated and available on the Institute's website at iii.org slash presentations. The Deepwater Horizon exploded and caught fire on April 20th, 2010, off the coast of Louisiana in the Gulf of Mexico. Tragically, 11 workers are presumed dead as a result of the explosion and fire. The rig itself sank on April 22nd in 5,000 feet of water. This is a very large event from the perspective of the global energy insurance business. So far, the estimates are that the losses will range from about one and a half to three and a half billion dollars in terms of insured losses. And so far, approximately 20 insurers have announced those losses. The Deepwater Horizon event is today the second largest in terms of the volume of oil spilled in, in world history, uh, with about 1.2 million barrels spilled through June 3rd, 2010 from the initial date of the explosion of fire, April 20th, 2010. It is exceeded only by the Ixtac 1 uh, blowout, which occurred in 1979, and which took more than nine months to put out uh, off the coast of Mexico. That particular spill uh, totaled 3.3 million. Uh, by way of reference, most Americans are familiar with the Exxon Valdez grounding, which of course did not involve a well blowout, but was the grounding of a tanker vessel in Alaska in the 1980s. Uh, that released approximately 260,000 barrels of oil, so this event already is more than four times the size of the Exxon Valdez. Offshore oil platforms are very complex and technologically advanced structures. They are very expensive to operate, and they are often operated in a partnership structure. In the Deepwater Horizon, uh, BP owned approximately two-thirds of the project with Anadarko Petroleum, 25% of the project, and Mitsui Oil, 10%. Uh, because BP is the lead on this, uh, it effectively assumes most of the liabilities associated with it, apart from those uh, that are, are specific to Mitsui and Anadarko and some of the other uh, players uh, which uh, were involved, and we'll discuss some of those in a moment. Now, uh, there are many types of insurance that apply to very complex offshore drilling operations. Obviously, business interruption and loss of production income, which would cover these businesses in the event that their ability to, uh, to pull gas uh, from beneath the surface is interrupted in some kind of a way. Usually, something like that would occur after a hurricane, for example. Uh, there are a variety of liability policies uh, that can pay third-party liability uh, in the event of uh, bodily injury or property damage to individuals. Uh, there is also environmental pollution liability that many of these firms would carry and a special coverage called operator's expense, operator's ex extra expense, which would pay for the costs associated with gaining control of a well after a blowout. Uh, physical damage, so this would cover physical damage to the company's offshore property and equipment, uh, such as the platform itself. Uh, and then, of course, policies that would cover uh, losses of life to employees uh, or their injuries, such as workers' compensation and employers' liability. The important thing to remember is that with respect to the Deepwater Horizon event, BP is in fact self-insured meaning that it does not purchase insurance on the private market. Uh, it has a captive, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of a company whose primary business is not insurance. In BP's case, uh, this captive is named Jupiter Insurance Limited. It has about $6 billion in capital and is highly rated and, and is financially strong, at least at the time of the event. Uh, several of the other players have various types of liability policies in place, uh, Anadarko, Mitsui, and Transocean. Uh, there is potentially hundreds of billions or several billions of dollars of coverage available. Uh, the ultimate amount that will be triggered uh, under after the Deepwater Horizon event uh, cannot yet be completely determined, hence the range in ultimate losses from somewhere between 1.4 billion and 3.5 billion at the current point in time. Halliburton, Cameron, Transocean, 
Uh, these are some of the other players apart from BP and its partners in the project. Now, these losses are large from the perspective of the global offshore insurance energy business. Uh, however, and as mentioned, uh, with about $1.4 billion, uh, according to initial reports in terms of insured losses, those could range as high as $3.5 billion. These losses are spread around the world uh, by, through insurers and reinsurers. This is very typical of large-scale offshore energy losses. And again, uh, because BP is self-insured and owns 65% of the project, uh, the losses will be relatively small uh, compared to the overall economic damages uh, and that are in occurring as a result of the spillage of oil. Lawsuits, of course, are inevitable. They have already occurred, and uh, we are seeing those against uh, not only BP, but equipment manufacturers, suppliers, and subcontractors, and a variety of other parties. BP, most notably, has said that it will assume liability for all quote-unquote legitimate claims caused by the oil spill. Uh, and ultimately, it seems clear that the primary liability for cleanup costs will rest with BP uh, and uh, its partners in the project. Uh, num numerous lawsuits have been filed uh, by fishermen and others uh, in the area who've been impacted. And as of May 24th, there were about 110 lawsuits filed against BP, Transocean, Halliburton, and Cameron. Uh, they, we will show the distribution of those suits as of May 24th in the moment. Uh, but the establishing legal liability in the offshore framework is rather difficult. Uh, there are different legal frameworks uh, involved uh, in the maritime business and in the energy business. And so these are very complex uh, involving uh, some laws that in fact go back to the middle of the 19th century. Also, there are, some, uh, stat there are statutes on the books that, uh, that were originated in the wake of the 1989 Exxon Valdez disaster, such as the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, and there are efforts to try to change that, including retroactively. Uh, and so we do have a Transocean, for instance, looking at an 1851 act to try to limit its liability to 27 million dollars. Uh, obviously, this is going to be taken up by the courts. Now, of the types of suits that are likely to be filed, of course, personal injury and death claims uh, on behalf of the families of persons suffering injury or death in the initial explosion of the platform. We could see product liability suits in terms of equipment manufacturers, equipment used on the rig that may uh, have, that has been alleged to have failed and uh, natural resources damages, of course, to the water, to the air, to the seashore, and claims by businesses and others for lost earnings and property damage, uh, most notably fishermen and trippers, uh, anyone connected with the tourist business that may have been, uh, tourism business that may have been in the area and has been uh, affected. Um, there are, could be loss, allegations of lost revenues uh, at the government level, such as uh, uh, taxes and royalties and lease payments, and uh, shareholder and securities class action suit, at least one has already been filed against BP, uh, and others could face uh, similar sorts of litigation. Uh, environmental claims are going to be uh, probably the most numerous um, on the part of those who have, in fact, seen their livelihoods in some way diminished by the release of the oil into the Gulf. And potentially, uh, in the wake of the disaster, where hundreds or thousands of people are being employed to clean up the oil uh, as, it, uh, as it makes its way across the sea and on land. Uh, some have alleged that their health has suffered, and so there could be potentially uh, health claims made by workers uh, after, uh, after they work on the job for a while and uh, claim to become ill. Uh, what we see here is the distribution of lawsuits, and we can see that nearly a third of those lawsuits are related to environmental issues. Uh, and then led uh, then uh, personal property issues such as you can imagine boats, uh, land uh, would be the next most common torts to land, personal injury, and a variety of others. Now, uh, one of the most important uh, pieces of legislation governing the liability associated with the oil spill in the Gulf is the Oil Pollution Act of 1990 adopted in the wake of the Exxon Valdez disaster, which was in 1989. The act uh, has a limit of $75 million uh, per occurrence, um, except in situations where 
the responsible parties were found to have in fact been grossly negligent, in which case there is no limit of liability. It is also the case that uh, apart from the $75 million, uh, the firm is still responsible for the cleanup uh, of any oil above and beyond that $75 million, and that also is unlimited. Now, uh, notably, the attorney, U.S. Attorney General has filed, a, 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 made a statement that it has opened criminal and civil investigations against, uh, against BP. That was on June 1st of this year. Uh, and, of course, BP is going to face very significant fines uh, from potentially a variety of government agencies. And in addition, uh, BP faces potentially billions of dollars of lost earnings due to its damaged reputation. Uh, that has, uh, as of yet, an unclear impact on its ability to perhaps participate in future such projects in this area. As mentioned, the Oil Protection Act of 1990 limits, makes offshore uh, facility, uh, facility uh, users liable for only $75 million per spill, uh, plus removal costs. And again, this does not reply, uh, just does not uh, apply in cases where the firm is found to be grossly negligent. However, um, the $75 million amount is viewed to be uh, insufficient uh, by Congress, uh, which has since introduced legislation seeking to raise that limit of liability to $10 billion. Congressional hearings during the second week of June in 2010, uh, in which I testified uh, the, the outcome of that was that uh, it's unlikely that the private insurance and reinsurance industry would be able to provide $10 billion in liability coverage. You can read that testimony again uh, by downloading it on the Insurance Information Institute's website. Now, it's also been discussed that the $10 billion uh, new cap in liability could be imposed retroactively. Uh, this is problematic for a variety of reasons. However, uh, Department of Justice seems to be indicating that they believe uh, that it is possible. Uh, and there's rising concern over the impact of raising these liability, uh, these liability caps on the cost of insurance. It would clearly increase the demand for insurance uh, overall, and it would also require much higher levels of insurance, which would certainly increase the overall expense to operators in the marketplace. Uh, so far uh, in the markets, uh, what we see is anywhere from a 15 to 50 percent increase in the cost of insurance for offshore, offshore producers. Uh, this is more in the deep water area versus the shallow water area. Um, and uh, there are some who believe that uh, rates could in fact double over the next year. Um, it's unclear what the ultimate impact will be. It will depend on what the ultimate impact is associated with the, with the Deepwater Horizon event and also uh, what Congress decides to do with liability limits uh, associated with the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. Now, this reverses what was basically a soft market in the energy insurance uh, space where prices were generally decreasing. Uh, but again, demand is going to be up, uh, and that uh, will, in fact, as well as the risk, uh, for a variety of reasons, and this will is already pushing up the cost of coverage in the Gulf. So I'd like to thank you for joining us for that update on uh, the Deepwater Horizon disaster and the implications for the insurance industry.